Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 370 for Monday, January 16th, 2023. <music> Greetings, folks. And welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Sponsors for this episode include Rocket Money, where you can go to rocketmoney.com slash gig gab and cancel all those useless subscriptions you have and save hundreds per year. We'll talk more about that in, uh, in depth in a little bit. For now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. I was going to say back here in Durham, New Hampshire, but I didn't go anywhere other than on this journey of what I thought was COVID at first, but um, it was it was not. At least the, the tests all said it wasn't. You probably heard my voice maybe a little scratchy last week. You probably heard it a little congested this week. Last week was the beginning of this thing that I picked up probably traveling to and from CES or at CES more likely, but... Um, I had a mild, faint positive on Wednesday, but Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Sunday were all negative COVID tests. So I, mm. I, I think it was the flu, but man, I, like I've had COVID twice in the last year, Paul, uh, whatever I had last week kicked my butt all mm. over like Thursday morning, Thursday was probably the worst of it. I don't know. It's all a blur, but like my 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 body temperature in Fahrenheit and my pul my heart rate were both the same at a hundred. Like my resting heart rate was a hundred beats per minute, and my um my temperature was a hundred Fahrenheit. It was like wow. I couldn't sleep because my pulse was just racing. I, I don't know. Like my, clearly, my body was fighting something. Obviously, but um, yeah, man, it was it was no joke. Whatever it was, probably the flu. A friend of yeah. mine who went with us to CES got tested for the flu and for COVID. He had the same thing or the same symptoms. So presumably the same thing. It came back negative on the flu, but his doc was like, yeah, it's probably the flu. No now joke. they're just in no this joke. RSV thing, right? And then there's RV. the RSV, but they say that's not like the fever and all that stuff. I don't know, man. I'm no doctor. Barely a drummer. Well, I know a lot of people have gotten sick this winter. I mean, and you throw in the complication of, is it? covid and what is covid anymore and are the symptoms different than they were and yeah so hard to track it all i mean i know i had i was stuffed up like crazy couldn't get in to see the doctor before christmas i i christmas i think was on a sunday and i started feeling pretty congested the previous monday couldn't get into the following tuesday after christmas literally couldn't breathe couldn't i couldn't you know it was just constant yeah gave me some prednisone gave me some amoxicillin Cleared up the head pretty quickly, but I still have something dripping into my into my lungs. Oh. I have to cough about every hour or so, and something comes, you know, yeah, it comes up. But gross. um, it's it, yeah, it's gross. Gross. Hey, hang on, hang on one second. I'm getting some audio glitches. I screwed something up. Let me reset the audio here. And I think I did it. So there we go. Can you still hear me? For, I can. For what it's worth, I couldn't hear the um, theme song. Oh, interesting. Oh, uh, that's really, okay. That's weird. You should have, you're not hearing yourself on echo or anything, right? Nope. Huh? That's weird. All right. Well, hopefully the listeners heard it. So there, there you go. Well, Real I'll figure, time recording here. I'll figure that out. Yeah. Who knows what I did? Maybe, maybe it was the, the buffers. I don't know, man. I, uh, Mac OS Ventura. I know this isn't the show where we talk about Macs and all that stuff, but Mac OS Ventura and, and audio, especially aggregate audio devices, which is what I use with logic here. No bueno, man. I, I upgraded to Ventura about a month ago because they finally released a uh, personas finally released the audio drivers for the quantum 2626, which is what I use to, to, to do everything in my studio. And it has not been the best experience for me in fact it's audio hijack too audio i mean everything's updated so i mean it all works in in um in mac os ventura but like 
I, I use logic as my, as like the mixer and the audio router and all that stuff, which is way better mm-hmm. now that I increased the amount of buffers to, to five minutes ago or two minutes ago, whatever it was. Uh, but, um, I have to use an aggregate audio device, which is this thing that you do and you run this app called audio MIDI setup on your Mac mm-hmm. and you can like link multiple audio devices together. It's the only way I can like grab discord audio, which is what I use for you for the, um, for the podcast and like my live mic at the same time. Cause logic will only see one audio device at a time. And so what I do is I build this aggregate audio device. That's the device that logic sees. And it can be a blend of like this virtual device for discord for you and the real device for, um, for the, you know, the, the quantum thunderbolt interface for me and it has worked fine for years and it still works but there's something weird about aggregate audio devices in mac os ventura short version if you haven't if you have an audio setup on your mac that's working well i would not upgrade to ventura yet Uh, i would wait and i i might even roll this one back to to monterey which is the previous os i don't know something it's just Dave it's, knows his stuff, people. Listen to Dave. It's chewing too much of my time, man. So, but those aggregate audio devices are cool because it lets you, you know, merge things together that otherwise couldn't be seen simultaneously. So, I mean, like that Ooh. part of it's cool. It just doesn't, I don't know, doesn't work as well as it used to, which sucks. Mm. Um, and what doesn't suck is I, I neglected to share last week that while I was out at CES, and maybe this is where I went and, and got whatever this flu was. Uh, I got to see Def Leppard, JBL Harmon, uh, put on their, well, I was going to say annual party, but it had been three years. Uh, they put on their party that they put on at CES at this, uh, it used to be called the joint now because the hotel is no longer the hard rock. It's the Virgin hotel. I think it's just called the theater at the Virgin hotel or something. Uh, but it's the same place. It's a 2000 seater venue. I think. It, they they let about a thousand people in. They don't even bother opening the balconies, so it really becomes this like intimate showcase with like a full rock and roll stage. And they had Def wow. Leppard play. Yeah, and uh, I mean that's you know, where Brad I've, did. You know, uh, Brad did sound for Def, Def Leppard for years, right? Oh no, kidding! I did not know that. Oh yeah, oh. yeah, many years. Oh, I had no idea. Oh, if he told me that, I forgot it. So, oh, that's very cool. Yeah, they were. I did not know what to expect going into this, you know? And so my, my, the bar was set in my, in my head was set pretty low. It was like, well, how's Def Leppard going to be? I mean, they, you know, like this band's all about like soaring vocals and, and like perfect harmonies and all of that stuff. I mean, that's what that band was in the eighties, you know? Yeah. And, uh, man, like they nailed it. It was a fantastic show. Really? Joe's putting some things down, right? He doesn't phrase everything quite in the stratosphere like he used to when he was, you know, 40 years ago. Um, No, but most of it was still in the stratosphere. Uh, they, wow. they, you know, it's a private gig. So they, I, I believe they are only, I didn't contract them, so I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure they're contracted to play for an hour. Right. And I'm pretty sure that's how it works for all of the bands there. Like, when I saw Sting, he played his full 61 minutes. Def Leppard played their 61 minutes. The Foo Fighters played like two hours because they're the Foo Fighters, but I'm sure they were only contracted for an hour, you know. So <laughs> because they're the Foo Fighters, you know. Uh, but like they, they, so they played, they only had to play an hour. They didn't have to go out and do a two hour set or something. They played m- basically just a string of hits. They played one new song, which was fantastic. Like it was just as. It sounded like a Def Leppard song. You know, it's like if you told me it was a B side from something from, you know, 1984, I'd be like, all right, sounds good. You know, right. yep. so they have only one non original member in the band. Is that right? I believe the guitar players. Yeah. The, um, it, the, 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 and, and it's Vivian Campbell who is the quote unquote new guy. Right. But I think he's yeah. been with Def Leppard for 20 years now or something. Right. You know, and he's just not a founding member. He's not a founding member. Correct. Correct. But yeah, he, uh, he joined the band in 1992, but yes, he was not, he was not a a founding member. Yeah. They were, they were teenagers when they hit, right. They they were really young. They were young. I, yeah, I don't know if they were teenagers or not, but, but they were definitely young. Yeah. Yeah. 
They played really song. well. Great. I mean, they were whatever their path in life was, you know, they had great management, great production right from the very beginning. I mean, they were yeah. they were they were that good from their first album. Yeah, I, I was trying to explain to I was having this conversation in one of our Backbeat Media staff meetings where we have ages ranging from you know, I think one of our staffers is probably older a little older than me, but you know, people in our 50s to people in our 20s. And it and it's hard to impress upon someone who did not live through the 80s just how monumental Def Leppard was in mm. their heyday. Like they, you know, I mean, everybody, if you listen to music, you know their songs or you know their hits, a few of them anyway, it, you know, but they, they like owned the charts in the 80s for a little yeah, while there. They, sure. they were huge. Yeah, huge. And you hear a lot of, you know, like for our world, you hear a lot of bands cover Pour Some Sugar on Me, mm -hmm. but you rarely hear a band, you know, approach how great Def Leppard plays their stuff live. Oh, it's, it, it's, I, it's really difficult to do that. I, I, I yeah. when I got home and while I was on the couch in my like fever dreams or whatever, I was just like digging around YouTube and I found those, uh, the rock band geeks, I, I'm, I'm saying it wrong. The, the, there's that band of people that play, that do cover songs it, like in situ, like we did with, um, with the Macworld All-Star Band. Everybody records in their own house or whatever, you yeah. know, and they, they do a video together. But they pull in, at times, lead singers that are perhaps a little more well-known than those guys are. And they pulled in Constantine Maroulis to do a cover of Photograph with him. And he did a great job. And the band did a great job on the harmonies and it just illustrated how difficult that song was. I'll find a I'm, I'm rock and roll geeks, rock band geeks. I forget who it is. It's Richie. Oh crap. Castellano's band. I think. Mm, it's, I yeah. He's, he's a guitar player. Great. I mean, they're all great players. And, uh, but you know, Constantine, he's got a, a huge range and like he had to push to, to hit some of those notes. Like the, that song is up there, man. And, yeah, and then yeah, all yeah. the harmonies are just like, it's, it's yeah. Well-crafted. I mean, you gotta wonder what, what that was like production wise. I mean, did they, did they really, you know, this, this, they didn't meet as teenagers. We know that they grew up together. Right. You know, did, were there really that many great singers in that band? Same with Van Halen though. The harmonies in Van Halen, are those guys really that good a singer or the, is that a miracle of production and a miracle of live sound wizardry that, that re recreates those kind of harmonies? Uh, I'm well, I, for Van Halen, I, I can answer these questions based on experience. I, I don't think there's that much live sound wizardry available to make these bands sound that good. Like Def Leppard nailed those harmonies the other night. Um, mm. And Van Halen, I mean, David, David Lee Roth is not really much of a singer. He's a fantastic front man, was a fantastic front man. I will <laughs> say Sad what's happened with that. Uh, but uh, Michael Anthony is a killer singer. And, you know, going out and seeing him and Sammy play with whatever outfit they happen to be with at any point in time, Chicken Foot or, um, you know, The Circle or or, or just Sammy and the Cobbles. Just one guy. I mean, how do they do Running With The Devil? No, so, Running With The Devil was Michael Anthony and uh, Eddie Van Halen singing the harmonies. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, even two guys that are that. Those guys did. Those guys could sing together. Oh, yeah. Van Halen was a great vocal band in that sense. And then when they added Sammy, they had three people that could really sing. Right. You know, right, right. like, yeah, no, I think I, I don't. I mean, I'm sure they use some studio wizardry. But look, back in the 80s, auto tune wasn't really a thing like it is now. Yeah. You know, you had to just sing it, man, and get it right. Uh, yeah, I know. I think those two bands can sing. Uh, 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 or, you know, the people that were in those bands could sing yeah. at the time. Uh, obviously, Eddie can't sing anymore. And Dave, we already talked about, but, you know, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, I, I was, I was happy to have gone. Like, I really was blown away. Um, and surprisingly so, which was great. I was also blown away by uh, a movie I watched the other night. I went and or I didn't go anywhere. I sat on my couch as my fever dream was starting to subside. And Disney Plus has this movie called If These Walls Could Sing. It's about Abbey Road. What a, a documentary done by 
uh, Paul McCartney's daughter, Mary, she put she it all together. It. She, yeah, there's a lot more of her in the first four minutes than there is throughout the movie. I mean, she, she produced the movie. She created the movie, but she's her, her presence in it is, um, limited and, and well, in a, in an appropriate way, like she, she's there, she explains who she is and then she gets out of the way so that the, the real stars of the movie can sort of shine through. Um, obviously Paul McCartney's in it, Elton John's in it. They talk about Cliff Richard, uh, who was really the first rock musician, rock band who recorded at Abbey road. And the studio was kind of falling by the wayside. They weren't, you know, they weren't getting the same kind of work they used to be getting. And so they, uh, EMI was like, all right, we'll find, you know, some rock and roll band that we can pull in here. And and they did. And obviously that worked. Um, one little, there were many interesting t- t- What? go ahead. Sorry. What's that? Obviously it worked. <laughs> Obviously it worked. Yeah. But then they had to like reinvent again in, uh, in the eighties with, uh, bringing movie scoring in. That's when John Williams came in. I think the first movie John Williams did there with an orchestra was Raiders of the Lost Ark. And then, uh, they, you know, when, uh, Return of the Jedi came out that they or was in production. They did that there too, but that was a whole You're thing. Friends with Giles, though, did, haven't any of these great Beatles reissues come out of that studio? They all have. Oh yeah. 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 But like, they're not recording new tracks there. Like they, they, he's, he's mixing them in studio three or something, it, you, you know, it's like, yeah. but, but they've, they've, they had to reinvent a couple of times. Like the, you know, the eighties was not a good time for large, you know, large volume recording studios. People were, were using drum machines and didn't need all the space that a place like Abbey road, uh, was paying taxes or rent or, you know, whatever on. So, um, it, yeah, it was like, that was, that was where the whole, you know, film scoring thing happened was they were like, that was a, a hail Mary in a sense. They were like, all right, well, we got to buy a, you know, 80 foot screen or something and put that up and get the sync machine so that we can sync with video and do all that stuff so that we can like hopefully attract a, you know, someone like a John Williams to come in and do it, which they did obviously. But, um, there were a couple of like musical trivia tidbits that I did not know. Uh, first was that, Elton John as a young Reginald Dwight or Reg Dwight, as he was credited on a lot of things was a session musician uh, and worked at Abbey road, a bunch on a bunch of different Mm. tracks. The Hollies, he ain't heavy. He's my brother has him on piano and he got like 12 pounds for that performance. (laughs) Yep. And and he's like, listen to it. He's like, you can hear it's my style. He's like, it do- doesn't take a whole lot to to convince you that I'm, you know, telling the truth. And then they found like the the track sheets that list, you know, oh yeah, okay, this is who was on piano or whatever, and it listed like Reggie Dwight or something like that. And uh, Jimmy Page was also a session musician at Abbey Road, and he tells a fantastic story of playing on. You know, I will let you guess the movie theme song that he played on Paul. I'll give you one guess and then I'll just, uh, and then I'll spoil it for everybody. But do, do you have any idea? Have you, had you heard about any of this? I have heard and I'm, I, now I'm crossing all the stories that are in my mind and I'm trying to remember. You're going to say it. I'm going to smack my head because I, I do know the answer to this, but it's, um, it was in 1964. It was a James Bond movie. Ah. Was it Dr. No? No, it was Gold. I mean, it might've been Dr. No, but it, he, he definitely played on Goldfinger. He plays the acoustic guitar on Goldfinger. And he, he had a, like a front row, literally a front row seat to watch Shirley Bassey sing it because they were, they were doing it in sync with the movie uh, somehow there. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah. With the credits of the movie or something like that. So yeah. Craziness. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah. You know, he's like, most people know me as an electric guitar player, but you know, I did a bunch of session work and you know, this, that, and the other. I was like, dude. Amazing. So it's a, it's a great movie. I haven't ruined most of it for you all. So I, I still highly recommend you watch it. It was, um, I also, here's trivia. He also played on Petula Clark's downtown that hit. Really? Yeah. Huh. The things, 
the things we learn. All right. Well, it's 2023 and you can say goodbye to last year's outdated, disorganized methods of managing your money and say hello to our sponsor, Rocket Money, the better way to hack your finances in 2023. Rocket Money, formerly known as Truebill, is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions. It monitors your spending and it helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of us have subscriptions we've forgotten about, like that streaming service you bought to just watch one show on or that free trial that you never used. Rocket Money is so cool. It goes in and quickly and easily identifies all your subscriptions for you. And then you get to decide, obviously, which ones you want to keep. But it gets even better because Rocket Money makes canceling subscriptions as easy as the click of a button. You simply find the subscription you don't want. And what do you do? You press cancel. Rocket Money will cancel it for you. So, you know, those companies like I talked recently about how the Wall Street Journal doesn't have a cancel button on their website. Rocket Money's got a cancel button for that subscription. That's how I did it. It works great. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. You got to check this out and you got to stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash giggab. That's rocketmoney.com slash giggab, G-I-G-G-A-B. Yeah, just like we always spell it. Rocketmoney.com slash giggab and our thanks to Rocket Money for sponsoring this episode. All right, Paul, you, um, you found an interesting piece. I'll, I'll call it a piece. It was really just a, yeah. a question that uh, our friend Adam uh, from Cover Band Confidential posted in the Cover Band Central group uh, asking for tips about building a, a successful cover band. And, and there's some interesting things in there. Yeah, this is going to be fun. So Adam is at Cover Band Confidential. We've had him on the show. And our buddy Steve Witchell was one of our first guests ever. Is um, He hosts the cover band Central Group. And Adam posted, what's a tip about building a successful cover band that you wish you knew earlier? So 216 comments later. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you can kind of anticipate where some of these things are going. I'm going to try and I'm going to group some of the – to set it all up, I'll, I'll group it into a couple of big buckets – and then we're just going to cherry pick some of these comments and we can talk about them. Is that cool? Sounds great. I, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, we'll do the reading so you don't have to dear listeners. So um, the, the first big bucket, which is actually one we should dive into right away is about repertoire. And there's definitely a camp that is like, you know, the way to be a successful cover band is to learn it as close to the record as possible. And then there's a whole, camp that says that's silly you know the way to be a successful cover band is you know put your own put your own vibe into it oh interesting and i find you know we've had that conversation right sure i would just say this i'm going to throw this out as our first salvo you you in many cases you cannot play it the way it is a studio recorded right and so once you're anything different once your guitar is not exactly the same sound once you're once you're playing the game of close, but not exactly the same, how can you justify that it all needs to be, you know, spot on to the record? It can't right? be. I mean, I mean we just I, talked I, about, we just talked about pour some sugar on me, right? I, I played that, yeah. Chafed used to play that song. Uh, the vocals, the hook there was, needs to be. what's that? Say that again. The hook, the hook you know, don't mess with the hook, right? I, yeah. But, yes. But even like I had a, uh, a, a, or I met a, a friend, he's still a friend. Uh, this uh, guy named Ron Marks, guitar player uh, that I met when I was living down in Austin. And he was, he was already a seasoned cover band musician. He made his living when I knew him playing in a cover band. He actually just played in one band called Dysfunction Junction. Uh, they played about four nights a week in and around Austin. And that that's how he made his living. Uh, and he said, and he had done this, six or eight nights a week or something like that uh, when he lived in Florida years before, you know, so in a tourist area or whatever. And he said, oh yeah, he's like, you just, you know, listen to the song and what's the one part of the tune that jumps out at you? Like, like you said, the hook, but it might be, you know, uh, it might be like the guitar riff that opens the song or something or that plays through the verse or so, whatever that thing is, get that right. 
and then move on. That's it. Like he's like, the rest is going to fall into place that once people hear the thing that's familiar to them, their brains will fill in the rest. you got to deliver something close, but it doesn't have to be exact. And they will think it was exact. Like, yeah, yeah, I like that. So, yeah. And, and let, along with that conversation, there's a whole detailed amount of thread to this. That is, it's a business. You're not there to, you know, please yourself. You're, you know, you're there to give people exactly what they want. Get the, you know, a lot of them said, get the women out on the dance floor, you know, sexist but but uh, sure. yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. but you know i i actually think that um i think there's room for both i think you can find a little art and pleasure in finding some gems you earn the right to play those by giving people a lot of what they want and then you can kind of take a little turn and, and do some i mean definitely what you've done with fling you guys don't play a a top 40 set a lot of the stuff was never top 40 right maybe Maybe AOR top 40, but yeah. yeah. I mean, and now Fling barely plays any covers at all. We're just playing originals out there now. And you uh, still get booked. Correct. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I would also say a lot of the discussion was, you know, the spectrum of perspectives of what, what is business like and what is not business like. Definitely a lot of comments about, you know, it's a stage. People going to, you're going to be up. People going to be looking at you dress appropriately, you know, there are a lot of perspectives about take care of your business. Give people. I want to, I want to go back to the repertoire because the business part is good to get into here. But I, I, as far as the repertoire, I have one last thing. Well, one more thing to say. I don't know if it's the last thing. Mm -hmm. And that is deliver on what you promise, manage expectations, right? If people are expecting you to be a, you know, Def Leppard or an eighties tribute act, that's very different than saying, hey, we're fling and we're going to play these covers the way we play them. Like two, that, That's two very different sets of expectations for someone coming in the door, you know, getting ready for you to, to hit your downbeat. I think that's super important. The way you market yourself, not only to the, the you know, bookers, owners, managers at the club, but the people who are walking in the door, the the fans who are going to come see you, the, sure. the audience, as long as you're giving them what they've expected and, and hopefully delighting them and maybe even surprising them. That's the key, right? Surprise, delight, manage expectations. Yeah. I would, my experience with the house rockers has been, if you give people a lot of what they yeah. expect, yeah. you create the opportunities for you. And if you're a good entertainer, Yes. You create the opportunity to do some other things to satisfy any kind of creative itch you have. I, I personally am one that, yes, it is business and there is a path to being successful. That path has many parts to it. Um, uh, here, here's a good example. There's a great band in the Santa Cruz, California area called Samba Da. They are a Brazilian Latin rhythms band. They play a lot and they are super popular. That's not top 40 music, right? They just create their own vibe and they're really good at it. And people line up to see them because they're really good at it. And what they promise you is a great, you know, island themed party, you know, tropical party. Sure. And that's what you get every single time. So, you know, I'm, I'm not one to, to say everything has to be close to the record. I mean, so, and, and for some other people, maybe that's the joy of it. Like figuring out how to get it as close to the record. Good for you. You know, sure. Via con Dios. Right. But, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think at the end of the day is like, what is, what is the combination of things in your group that you could do that makes you entertaining, that makes people want to come see you over and over again? And if you can be that, you actually open yourself up to different things. We, like, here, you know, a good one. Um, I'm trying to think about that, that uh, kind of reggae feel song that Harry Belafonte did and the Grateful Dead did. Man. Man, man, man smart, woman smarter. That's the one. You do a great, a great version of that. That is a great freaking party song that yep. everybody gets a kick out of, right? Yep. It ain't top 40, right? No, but you, but you earn gotta, the right to do you that. You got to deliver it, though. And you do. Yeah. I, d d don't get me wrong, folks. If you've never seen Paul Kent deliver Man Smart, Woman <laughs> Smarter, go out of your way to make that I happen. <laughs> you, well, <laughs> but that's why you, like, see there, you're already entertaining, right? Like, you're, like, that's, that's the key is 
embracing it and delivering on what you're what you're putting out there for sure. Yeah, you can't half ass it, man. Yep. Yeah. So you know, th- and the the spectrum was full of do it like the record. You know, no, do it like you. Every you know, why do you want to be exactly like something that already exists? So right, interesting right. discussion there. Yeah. Next big bucket would be choosing bandmates, and it's the whole spectrum from always choose the best players to choose the people you have the most chemistry with. And if you can have best players be the most people you have the most chemistry with, you know, great for you. But there's definitely was a wide spectrum about how important the concept of a teamwork is to being a successful cover band to just having the most technically astute people on stage. Well, I see. Yeah. I think, I think, um, I think it's really important to have pros. I like, I know we talk about this all the time, but a pro can walk it. One of the, elements that a pro brings a pro player brings to the gig is they can walk on stage filling in or, or with a pickup band, you know, whatever the, it is, but playing with people that they don't regularly play with, perhaps they've never before played with and make it seem to the crowd. Like this is a band, right? You know, there's interaction happening. There's smiles going on. There's acknowledgement of little solos and things like that that are happening, big ears, big eyes, but that performance, that's, that's the, you know, that's a sign of a pro. That's one of the, the skills that a pro brings to the gig is pretending, acting, playing the part of a bandmate. And, and it, I've, I've seen it and I, I'd like to say that I've done it, but I've definitely, if I've, if I've been able to do it, it's because I've learned it from other people that I've played with and that I've seen you bring in a sub and it's like, oh, holy crap. Like this guy's playing, like he's in the band. <gasps> There's something to that, you, you know, and mm-hmm. you just got to own that. And it takes some confidence and, and of course, in order to be confident, you got to be prepared or just you know, insane. And either one of those is, it works out fine. Mm-hmm. As long as you can deliver, man, like that's the key is you got to deliver. And it's not just playing the notes for a gig. Like, like we're talking about here for some gigs, you know, if it's a classical gig, go play the notes, man. You, you know, don't, don't, don't be too showy. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. just make it happen. Team sport. Right. Yeah. Team sport, but know what the sport is. I think that's the important part. If we're going to go with the analogy. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so what All about right, the what about thing, the business side of it? Did I derail us off of that? Should well, we come back to that? You know, again, I in this conversation, 216 comments. Yep. Everybody who comments is positive that they know what the right what the what that means to be a business. Just like we are. And well, yes. But we are professionals, Dave. That's correct. And uh, uh there's just a wide spectrum from everything like, you know, show up to dress right to play it like the record play only what people want. Uh, you know, that, some people would put that under their business strategy sure. of what it is. Got so it. Got it, got I, it. so it's a wide, you know, you ask a hundred musicians what business means, you'll probably get a hundred different answers. And this was definitely represented you here. Probably get but 200 one answers really and all of them are wrong, yeah, yeah. but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. I love this one. This one guy was talking about, you know, uh, the d- distribution of work in a band. Remember the topic is what ma- tips for what makes a cover band successful. And this one, one guy said, if the band is a democracy, then one person shouldn't be the hardest working person in that band at all times. If they are, then it shouldn't be a democracy. Okay. <laughs> sure. I mean, no, I get that entirely. I yeah, mean, yeah. We, we, here's my perspective on that. Often, there's some guy who forms the band. It means a lot, guy or girl, means a lot to that person. And they want to do it so bad. Maybe it, often it's someone who's just getting back into things, but sometimes it's just someone who's, you know, either, you know, that type of personality controlling or, you know, just really needs to express their business vision for the band and they do all the stuff. Sure. But, but in the interest of keeping the band together, they democratize decision-making, but one person does all the work. Mm. That that is, I don't that's think that's a, a very, that's untyp- not a democracy. I that's a, but I don't think that's an untypical model. I think there's often like, like a guy who or girl who wants the group so bad is willing to take on the heavy lifting of some of the less pleasant stuff, doing the website, doing the marketing, getting the gigs, paying people, doing the taxes, whatever it might be, insurance, whatever, the business part of things. But in order to keep musicians connected to the project, 
you know, doles out the creative decision making. I don't think that's uncommon. I think that's no. I think that's common. common. I, I, I mean, it's it's certainly not universal, but no, it's not uncommon at all. Yeah, yeah, I right. agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And this all goes back to how good a leader someone is, like you know, and and how clear they are with setting expectations. And if you know that you're a good leader and you can get gigs, there's a cat in the Bay Area that I know who has put together four or five different tribute groups and he gets them work. And now he's got a pretty good book of booking contacts and he's, you know, put together some interesting groups that are tributes. Uh, But I think he democratizes because he goes out and gets really good players to do it often. And I think he democratizes the the creative part of it, but he does all the the sweat labor. And I think it's blown up on him a couple of times because he keeps changing. And I, 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 you know, not, not very close to it, but if you're a great leader, and you actually, if you're a great expectation setter and just say, listen, here's the deal. I'll do all the work. You will work. You will get paid. These will be good gigs. You know, you'll be on stages. You won't be on the floor in a corner of a restaurant. You know, you, you know, we will, we will work in good places, but in exchange for that, understand, here's the deal. Well, I mean, it, it, like that's what works for you. And, and I mean, I don't mean to. Doesn't be work. Dis- That's what I wish would work for me, but that doesn't work. For me. <laughs> I definitely have, have moved my line, compromised my line, you know, because I think a lot of people go into a creative project assuming that they get creative input into things, and not, and they all and there's a different value for what they put onto the the sweat part of it, right? Some people think it's no big deal, you know. Some some people appreciate it. Some people, you know. So I, but I I, I often find musicians unless the expectation is very, very clearly set. You can't just demonstrate it by doing it. The, the guy who's the leader can't just say, look how hard I'm working for you. You really have to have the conversation. I've just yeah, found it. It needs to be clear. Than- I, like I'm thinking of Uptown where when I joined the band, it was very much what like what you just described. It was like, here's the thing. Here's what we need from you. Like, down to here's the songs we're playing and of them, here are the songs you need to sing. And and like there were a few of them where it was like, okay, that like I can't sing that. You hired me already. I don't sing that song. This would have been a if that if that song's important to the set list and it's important that the drummer sings it, we yeah. probably should have had this conversation ahead of time. And I did I said that to Gary. It privately You told and, this story on the air before. I remember you telling the story. And in a nice way, but it was like you, you know, okay. like I can't living on a prayer with the song, right? What's that? Wasn't living on the prayer. The it was song? living on a prayer. Yeah. It was like, I, you know, that's out of my range. It's just not something that, that works for me to sing. And uh, he's like, well, we'll figure it out. It, and that's how, but and it, when we did, it was fine. Uh, but that's how the band was. When I joined, it was very regimented. And, and there was a machine that I was just stepping into this round of uptown celebration. I mean, the, the band took effectively three years off and, uh, now, you know, Gary is ready. He wants to put it back together, but there's far more, it's still his band, but there is far more room for creative input, um, in terms of, you know, the song choices and all of that stuff in the end, it, like assuming that we are still heading down the same path and Gary is the one doing the booking. So I, I, I think that's a safe assumption. I think we're going to wind up with a set list very similar to what we used to have just because it, you know, we're playing weddings and functions and those things. And so there's, there's a, you know, there, there's the expectation of what those customers want and it, but it very much is still a business. Like, I mean, a hundred percent. Why do you think he, he let the reins out a little bit? Um, I, I think it's because he, I think he wants more input this time around. I I think he's, he's looking for, okay, we're rebuilding this thing. We're not just starting it up again. There's enough new people involved. We've got a new bass player and a new keyboard player. So it's, and, and our sing, our female singer, Rachel, she played a bunch of gigs with the band and towards the end of the last run, she became our singer. But, but at that point she was dropped in to here's the song list. And we, we pulled in a few tunes that she brought, but nothing like it would be if we, if we started her. So it's probably Rachel is probably the, the main driving force of why we're retooling the song list so that, you know, she's singing songs 
that she's comfortable with as opposed to just well, this, this is what I'm saying. Role. This yeah. is what happens. You, yeah. you, you, you want to retain people. So you got to give them a little bit of input or a lot of input. And that's just even, one of the, I don't even know but he was about before he could go out and find someone else that, you know, saying, sings the songs that he wants to sing. Right. Yeah. I don't know that it's about retaining her as much as it is. He wants her to be like showing at her best. And so it's like, all right, well tell us what songs serve that purpose and of those tunes we'll select the ones you know we'll we'll try them all which we have and some yeah. of them are like okay well this is like you kill that song but I, I i don't know how often we're going to find an opportunity where that actually makes sense to play at an uptown gig so we're sort of sifting through it finding the ones that make sense for you know this band's purpose and and that's fine sure. but it you know it's it's about putting out the best product and and it really from that standpoint very much is still you know a business first of okay let's let's make sure we're delivering the right things and and doing yeah. the right things which is great i mean it's you know like to me that's how a band should right. be yeah or more. that so, kind of band like, should be I, and, and all not all bands are, are the same either in fact you know i know this is cover band central's po or a post in cover band central and so we're talking about cover bands not all cover bands are the same, not even close, right? You know, you got function bands and tribute bands and, you know, bar bands and like, they're, they're not the same and trying to be all right. of those things at, at the same time is nearly impossible. Well, I think you hear any of these tips and you, you measure them against whatever problems you're having in your band yes. and see if, you know, if it's a, if it's a path you haven't taken to kind of solve some things. Let me read a couple more, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Work with people you truly like. Don't trade personality for talent. If you love the people you're working with, your band will have longevity and it will be fun. Talent will come in time. If it's fun, it will be like an adventure with your best friends. If it's not, it will be like work. No matter how talented, it will not last because eventually you'll get sick of the people. Well, different, definitely different perspectives on that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't. I don't disagree with that. Again, it's what's the purpose of the band. If it's, you know, to go out and play, you know, two weddings a month, I, like, I don't know. Do you need to like the people like, you know, but versus like a band like bitter pill or fling far more important to prioritize like the, the band actually gelling when we're creating material together, we've got to be able to work together. It's not just show up on stage and play your tune and, and go home. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's a different thing. Yeah. So I, I think either one of like either side of that is correct. But again, depending on what your band's doing. Yeah. 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 All right. The set list is everything. You need to play what people want to hear. That's why so many successful cover bands, regardless of genre, play a lot of the same songs. I, I disagree. Well, you can find your way to that answer in a few different ways. Sure. You know, a lot of those same songs are as we've discussed, because you can be pretty bad at them and st they still go over. Right. I mean, right. some of those songs will stand all different types of butchering and are still, you know, and still can work. Um, you know, you haven't seen my fastball, right? <laughs> Which fastball song do you play? Sorry. <laughs> right. Right. Okay, couldn't help. Well, done. well played, yeah. All right. Let's see. Um, have fun. Is it a business? Yes, but you don't play for fun. It shows. And personally, don't stay and watch bands. I personally don't stay and watch bands like that. It's a cover band. You're not getting rich. This is all serious. Treat it like a business. BS will suck the fun right out of it. See the whole spectrum of people. Yeah. People's perspective. You know, and I, I think you and I said once once money goes from one person's pocket to the next person's pocket, there are a bunch of obligations. You know that are they're only reasonable to expect, and uh, you know. Your mileage may vary, your your venues may vary, but you know, it is a business if you're taking money for it. I think, right? Yeah, it, the, but there is an interesting asterisk there um, because it's one thing if you know you have a a person who gets the gigs and says, "Okay, I'm going to pay you, you know, a hundred bucks a gig or whatever you're paying, you, you know, your bandmate mates or whatever." And, you know, hires all the people and says, here's the songs you're going to play. And here's what we're playing. And we finish the gig and you give the people their hundred bucks and you say, thank you. And that was fun. And, you know, we'll see you next time. Like that, that's, that to me is definitely an employment scenario. And then there's the, Hey, we're putting this together. Everybody's doing whatever they can. And that doesn't mean everybody's putting in an equal amount. 
that that's to find a scenario with that, I think is, is a unicorn, right? But people are doing what they can. And that means the person that's good at booking is doing the booking. And if that's also the person who's good at like doing the sound or owns the gear, maybe there is one person that's doing far more than the rest. But if it is this, we're all in it together kind of thing, um, you get to the gig, you play the gig, you take the money from the gig, you split up the money from the gig. Now it's not one person paying the rest. It's everyone taking their share of the pot. And, and, I, and I, and, and th this is a, you know, we're picking a spot on a continuum here, right? Like there's, and there's many spots on this continuum. That's why it's a continuum folks. Mm -hmm. But it's less of an employment relationship when it's more the latter than the former. I, I think I, it doesn't, it doesn't mean it's not a business, but it does mean that it's less of an employer employee, you know, employer contractor, whatever the legal definitions apply. I, you know, I, I feel like there's, there's more of that we're all in this together scenario that can be had in those, let's just split up the pot at the end of the night scenarios versus, right. you know, I mean, and I realize I, I am splitting hairs here, but there is a palpable difference being in a band that's organized one way versus the other, you know, like monkey fist, there's no leader in monkey fist. We play the gigs, we split the money up at the end of the night. You know, we, we figure out how we're paying for dinner, you know, cause we usually have dinner at the club. If the club didn't buy it for us, you know, the, but it's, it's everybody's in it and everybody sort of has an equal stake in that. Well, it's a low yep. stakes gig for sure. Uh, but that's very different than like an uptown gig where, you know, Gary's the boss. He's paying us. He decides how the money is chopped up. Uh, he tells us what he's doing. He's transparent about it, but that doesn't mean we get mm -hmm. to decide there's, there's a, there's a right. difference there. Right. And, and, uh, and both scenarios are totally fine by me as you know, as Dave. Um, but it is a difference, you know, it, it, there's a, there's a, a different level of ownership in each of those scenarios. Yeah, I agree. And you know, this is the thing about cover bands and it blends into, this issue that we talk about, about how many people are in not you're, you're in cover bands for different reasons. For some people, it's yeah. their living for some people. It's fun for some people. It's a, uh, you know, could be a whole bunch of things. And that blends into this definition of business. You're kind of moving the line to suit whatever you believe it is. I got one more post. I'm going to share this guy actually, you know, gave about eight or nine. I'm gonna let I'm gonna read all eight or nine comments here. Okay. You cherry pick the best one, all right? All right. All right. One, play what people want to hear, not what you like. Two, don't waste time playing in dive bars. Three, be able to sound good at conversational volume. Four, always, always just for success. Don't bring in people who don't get this. Five, spend time, money up front and record a quality audio demo and video. Make sure you look like people that would be welcome at a black tie event. Next, six, have backing tracks available for all instruments so you can change the band's size to fit any situation and as a backup for emergencies. Seven, don't treat the band as a democracy. Be the leader or a member. It will run much smoother. If you're the leader, work hard to get listed with the best agencies and to get listed with the, with the uh, for the best gigs possible so good players will want to play with you. If you're a member, be agreeable, dress well, know your part, and make the gigs run smoothly. Eight, always have a wide pool of players to choose from for any given type of gig. Nine, recognize yourself as part of the service industry. Playing covering music doesn't make you special. Ten, always carry yourself as a professional. Don't drink or smoke on the job. Eleven, the customer is always right, at least in the moment. You can always choose not to work for them again. Next, don't cancel gigs ever. Get subs, use tracks, whatever it takes. And last, his last comment, so this one guy wrote all these things. Oh. To be successful, it's never about you until after the gig is over and you make that nice bank deposit. That sounds to me like a guy who, this is his living, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, th there are bits and pieces of, of some of those. I'm not going to say every one of those that, that I agree with. The, the one that really resonated, which won't be a surprise to anybody that's listened, is 
you know, be show up dressed for success, ready to, you know, ready to play. Like I, I don't have the the comment in front of me to, to read it back verbatim, but you know, that one show up, like you're going to go play a gig and, and, and then go play that gig. Yeah. Like that's, I don't know. The, 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 I actually reacted to the don't, don't waste time playing in dive bars. Huh. You know, if one of your marketing strategies is to always do things that are surprising to people, even if you're a good, you know, top light, top flight band in your area, you know, a surprise gig in a different type of venue every once in a while, if it's, you know, if it's not dangerous or anything like that might be, might be a good thing for your brand. Oh, playing dive bars is great, man. Some of my favorite gigs are, were in, have been in dive bars and will be in the future. I guarantee it. Like, Dive bars are can be great gigs because that because they generally are pretty relaxed scenarios, uh, and and you get a relaxed crowd in there, people who were ready to rock. I mean, I've also had some great gigs at you know high, what I'll call high stakes venues, although some dive bars are high stakes venues too. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Um, I love dive bars. I, I I hope I never stop playing dive bars, and I, I know I'll that send you that. I'll send you the link to this whole thread if people want to kind of d- yeah, dive we'll, deeper into it. We'll put but, it in uh, the uh, show notes there. Yeah. Yeah. It's just kind of fun. I mean, it kind of encapsulates. There's nothing in the thread that we haven't talked at least five, six, seven times about. Yeah. But it's kind of fun to see people just kind of pouring their hearts out. And, you know, everybody thinks they know. Even people who aren't in successful bands are pretty sure they know what is a successful path. So, <laughs> Well, and and nothing, nothing, no matter what is said in that thread Nothing makes people more knowledgeable about this than having a microphone in front of them, Paul. There you go. Or a keyboard. <laughs> no, I mean a podcast microphone. Like this uh... is this is the key. <laughs> oh man. I um I miss gigging. I haven't gigged in a while. I our last bitter pill gig was canceled because we had some illness in the band and then even the the Rocky Horror gigs that I was supposed to play were canceled because we had illness in the whatever other people. I think they had this flu thing that I now have. Um, my last Monkey Fist gig on Festivus was canceled because the weather, whatever. I guess it was that's that was the day it like rained and then the temp dropped or whatever. So I, I miss gigging. I'm supposed to have a Monkey Fist gig at the end of the month on the 29th, and I hope that happens. And then I get a fling gig the following week. Hope that happens. Like I'm, yeah. I miss getting out and like playing music, man. Yeah. When when was your last gig? Did you have gigs this weekend or? Or um, no, last weekend was off. I've got a bunch of solo stuff and trio stuff this coming week. Nice. House rockers are kind of once a month yeah. until May. And the nice thing, like I shared in last week's show, is we hadn't played in two months. Right. Right. And. Uh, we picked right up, which was a really comforting thing. And so we do have a rehearsal, you know, we're going to try and throw some new things together, try and bring some things out of the mothballs and, uh, you know, see what we can do to just keep it interesting for us, uh, moving forward, not playing it like the record, but uh, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Well, I hope you get back on stage soon. I'm sure it's Same. coming. Oh, it's, I, just, it's, it's coming. You know, this, is, this is a brutal winter. This is a brutal, I mean, rain out here, Yeah. you know, people getting sick. I mean, it's just, it's it's a brutal winter. It's all of it. I know. It's it's nuts, man. It's nuts. I miss it. I um it's coming. I know. No, I I it's it's interesting, you know, the whole lockdown thing. I I have learned not to take gigs for granted anymore. And and that that's still sticking with me. I I I think it was probably, you know, May of 2020 that I I shared on this show how you know if you called me at 3 p.m on the day of any gig i I would to to cancel it i would be happy about you know having the night off um Mm. i'm not and i wondered when if ever that sentiment would return and i'm not convinced that it has yet so yeah i don't know when i don't know when it will certainly not not as much as as it was pre uh, march of 2020 so I hope you folks are out there gigging. I hope you're out there having fun. Um, That's all we got for you this week. We're off next week. Paul and I both need to travel again. Let us remain healthy. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Let us know what you're thinking. 
We'll be back on the uh, 30th or thereabouts. What do they say, Paul? Always be performing, Dave.